Hello, this is the uh, next in the series of recordings about the Owen or Ogham alphabet. Um, we're on now to the letter N. Let's see, where are we? So that's N. Mm -hmm. mm, yep, that one there. Which, having put my crappy bit of cardboard thing in the jig aside, that is. Uh, there we go, is that in? That's not really in focus, but never mind. Can't see that if you're looking. Okay, we won't use that one then because it doesn't show up very well. I'll use the crappy cardboard one. <laughs> so Nu is often translated and given as meaning the ash tree. Although technically the word doesn't actually mean ash tree at all. Um, there's some ambiguity as to exactly what the word originally meant in early Irish. And uh, one translation is of a hayloft in a, in a barn, up, uh, the kind of upper part of a barn where the hay is stored. Uh, the other translation, which is the one I'm going for here, is a forked stick. Um, in witchcraft traditions in Ireland and in Britain and various other parts, well, maybe Ireland and Britain and some other parts, there were two, a, a, a staff, a long staff with, a, with a, the kind of forked end that comes out at the top, is referred to as a stang. So you could translate this if you want to be a little bit kind of um, keep it in the in the pagan family, as it were, as as a stang. So in terms of uh, a forked stick, a, a forked stick could be that big, couldn't it? But um, a stang is is a walking stick. It's a, a big walking stock. So you'd use it as and rest your thumb in the the um, cleft part there. So as you were going up a hillside or a mountain, you'd have that stick to take with you and carry yourself up. And I want to say that that's probably the image that um, was in the minds of early Irish uh, people when they were using this this um letter. Uh, the, the idea of something you would lean on and would take you away to help you on the journey through life. Um, you could read other symbolic meanings into a forked stick. So you could, the idea of it being forked, you could take that to represent, for example, like, like a fork in the road where you're stood at the junction and you could go that way or you could go that way and so you'd have an underlying imagery there if you want to use that idea of having to make choices in life do i go down path a or path b and all of us have had situations probably had hundreds of situations in life where we've been faced by some choice do i do this thing or do i do that thing and you never quite know which way your life is going to go until you make a decision and you do one or the other and then maybe afterwards you're always at the back of your mind you're thinking well what would have happened had I done the other choice how would things have gone um, there's a very good Doctor Who episode actually uh, called Turn Left in which uh, one of the characters uh, one of the Doctor's companions is sent back in time and you know, there's this kind of critical point in her life where she's driving to a junction and she's got two job interviews and one she has to turn left go to that job interview and the other she has to turn right to go to that job interview and the viewers know that because she went to one job interview she eventually got a job in a place where she met the doctor and became a doctor's companion but the evil forces are trying to persuade her to choose the other direction so she never will meet the doctor and then the whole episode is about all the things that would have happened had she not met the doctor rather than the things that did happen because she did meet the doctor and it's that kind of playing out of alternate realities, how would your life have gone, and obviously it's Doctor Who, so everything is very kind of um, dramatic and big scale. Uh, so it's not only her life that changes, it's, it's vast numbers of other people's lives that change, because all sorts of horrendous things happened because she was not with the Doctor in this parallel universe. Um, I'm not suggesting any of us are faced with kind of massive choices like that where we, we make a decision and then a million people die because we've made the wrong decision or something. But you never quite know what complications are going to set in. Now that would be a possible interpretation to go for in a reading. If you like the idea of a fork representing a, a choice between going left and going right, going this way, going that way. Um, so my personal feeling is that the forked stick image would be the I, the, the, the stang, the walking stock, something to help you and support you through life. Uh, the association with the ash tree does fit in reasonably well because ash grows very straight, it grows very very um, um, strong wood and, and is very very popular, it used to be very popular in making spear shafts and ship's masts, um, beams to hold up the roof of houses, anything where you need a really 
straight, strong shaft of wood that's um, you know, it's something that won't crack under pressure. And that kind of goes with a walking stop. You're leaning heavily on it as you're going up the mountainside. Your walking stop is not going to snap in half as you're three quarter ways up the mountain and then you've got to go the rest of the way by yourself. It's going to be with you the whole journey. And so that imagery I would associate, if you're in the reading, something like that, with a, a reliable friend, a dependable source of help, someone or something that's going to be with you through the whole journey that won't break under pressure, that won't give way, that's good and straight and true in, in the moral sense of being straight, I mean not the, the sexual sense of being straight, that they, it's, it's with you for, for life. So it would represent a person or a quality or a, a, an animal or a what have you that is with that person for the, the long haul and will support them on their journey. I mean, depending on how it comes out in the reading, it could also suggest, of course, that maybe the person you're doing the reading for is the one providing the strength and support and what have you to some other person. So either you're giving it to somebody else or somebody else is giving it to you in that sense of the strength and support and what have you. Um, so yes, there we go. That's that's the, the interpretation I prefer, but I've given the other one as well just in case and it's an excuse to talk about Doctor Who as well. So there you go. Um, in, in terms of the associated imagery, the um, number Owen is the number five, we're up to the fifth letter. Um, and that does crop up certainly in Irish myth in the, the number five frequently appears in organization structures. So in Irish law, the Brayon law that um, remained in place in Ireland really up until the coming of the Norman conquests, uh, they have lots of things in sets of five. So the five laws of this, the five laws of that. It was a, a way of, of thinking and organizing things into sets, if you like. One of the possible reasons why they might have favoured the number five is because politically, Ireland at that point, it had, has changed over time, but at that point, we're going back to Old Ireland, was divided into five provinces referred to as the Cockhead or the Fifths. The Cockhead is Gaelic for fifth, and the five fifths, so what I mean. So you, you've got the ones that are still with us, Leinster and Munster and Ulster and so on. Um, but you've also got... Meath, um, which is the smallest of them, and was regarded as the central province, the, the seat of the High Kings. Now, if you look at a map of Ireland, it's not actually geographically central to Ireland. It's sort of off to one side, um, rather than in the dead centre of the, you know, the other four provinces. But it is metaphysically in the centre. And so Ireland was divided into five political units, five um, jurisdictions, if you like. And so that, that tendency perhaps to think in terms of five when it came to politics, when it came to law, might have inspired a lot of, of the Brown judges and the Dowley, the, the barristers, to start organising laws and principles and concepts into sets of five. And of course, the five fingers as well. So you could have had the judge or the, or the, the Dowley sitting up there going, ah, oh, well, the five paths are, and literally showing to the court and the, the, the people in the court their, their hand as, as an illustration of the power of five. And you could argue, if you mean evolutionary perspective, why has humanity done as, as well as it has? Well, one of the reasons is this, the hand. <coughs> Particularly that opposable thumb, which gives us a phenomenal amount of dexterity and grip, which few other creatures have the level of dexterity that a human being has because of the way our hands are shaped. Um, that that is, is kind of our reach, our power, and what's the law, but a reach, a power of government to <coughs> manipulate, excuse me, to control, to guide, to steer the population, either in a positive way or in a negative way. So it's your, your capacity to influence. So you could, um, I suppose, if, again, thinking to readings in order if you want to use it as a, a chant, a talisman, something in that vein, um, noon as the representation of skill, of power, of, of your ability to manipulate, control, and influence, and shape, and exert your will over the environment that you're in. Um, could bring in a bit of sociological waffle if we're really um, pushing the boat out. And... Um, suggests that we all have a, a capacity for power. I, I don't mean power in that kind of Hitler mad cackling sense, but 
excuse me, that simply exerting our will is an act of power. Um, psychologists have said much the same for a long time. There's a German psychologist called um, Alfred Adler who wrote about what he termed the will to power. And again, he, he just meant it in the sense of exerting your will, exerting your choice. We want things in life. So we exert our capacity to choose to to, to do things. So you know, I wanted uh, a sandwich earlier on, so I went into the kitchen and I got the bread and I got the cheese and, and the pickle and whatnot, and I made a sandwich. I exerted my will, my capacity to power, which was a combination of me wanting it and me having the ability to do it. And that ability to do it was contingent on the fact that earlier on, I'd gone and bought the bread, I'd gone and bought the cheese, and I had the money to do so, and I knew, I had the knowledge in my head as to what would go into a sandwich, and lots of, I mean, this is a very small scale and trivial, but you could say the whole of life is a combination of these different sorts of factors. You've got to want something, you've got to have the will, but you've also got to have the skills, the talents, to make your will happen. When your skills could be exerted by going into the kitchen and making a sandwich, or it could be saying, if, if I was too lazy, or let's say I, was, I broke my leg and I couldn't get into the kitchen, I could ask somebody else to go into the kitchen and make a sandwich for me. That's still me getting what I want, exerting my will for the food, but I'm using a different route to get it. Or I could have gone to a, uh, the baker's up the road and bought a sandwich from there. Again, it's a different ways of getting the same thing. So again, thinking in terms of readings and stuff like that, this could be saying to the person you're doing the reading for, use your skills, use your knowledge, your, your drive, the fusion of those factors coming together to get what you want out of life. And, and perhaps if you can't get it one way, go down one fork in the road, think about going down another fork in the road and getting what you want in life by a different route. So in, in other words, if you can't get into the kitchen to make your own sandwich or go to the baker's shop and buy it from there, you can still get what you want, but you might have to do it by exerting a different set of skills to get what you want and, and it's the resourcefulness, the self-awareness and if you don't have the skills maybe it's suggesting well go and get them, <laughs> you know, make the effort to develop the skill set that you want, all that kind of thing. Um, that's a suggestion anyway. In terms of the bird um, Owen, we have Nescu the snipe and as, as much as I've searched and searched in various books and things around here and online and what have you, I can't find any mention of snipes in Irish mythology. Which doesn't of course mean that they weren't at once featured in Irish mythology, just that those stories <coughs> perhaps have not survived the passage of time. Um, yeah, Lots of stories have been lost on the way, so once upon a time there might have been dozens of stories about snipes, but I can't find any of them anymore. So I can't tell you anything profound or wise <laughs> about um, snipes in that sense. The colour of them is necht, which means clear or transparent, like water or glass, if you prefer. Which is a bit of an odd idea of a colour being a non-colour, but nonetheless, we'll go with it. It's there, there's no overt colour imagery associated with with necht transparency in mythology. However, we've got nechtown. Um, one of the Irish gods who is one of the husbands of the Moregu. Uh, there, there's various variations in myth. But Nechtown, who also crops up as Saint Nect in, in the Christian canon, so in um, down near Boss Castle, there is Saint Nectan's Glen, which is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. It really is a wonderful, magical place. And Saint Nectan is the, the Christianized version of a much older being associated with that place, the spirit of that is like a, a valley leading to a waterfall. Um, Necht, the same means clear, so the name comes from the, the, the imagery of water, the clear, transparent, clean, fresh, pure, sweet water, rather than murky, manky water that's full of old shopping trolleys and, and the kind of crap that we throw into water supplies these days. If you want to look for meanings and symbolisms in that, um, water can, when it's flowing, it's moving, it's in, in passage, is clear and pure and strong, unless someone has tipped a load of chemical slurry into it, of course, which is a slightly different issue again. But when water is um, blocked, the river is blocked, it's dammed up, potentially that water can start to stagnate and it becomes very really, um, murky rather than clear. Uh, and so this is perhaps about the, the, the importance of things moving and flowing and going and um, following their natural course rather than being 
stifled and stopped and blocked and turned from clear to murky to stagnant to smelly and horrible and unpleasant so it could be if, if you were using this in some kind of healing context suggesting that part of the, the individual's problems is, is a, a mental or emotional uh, a blockage in some sense perhaps even quite a physical blockage potentially that is causing what should be clean and fresh and pure to become stagnant and manky and murky and unpleasant and unhealthy and dangerous. That's rambling a bit, but you work around that. We then have the first word ohms associated with it. So I'll, I'll just read them out and then um, we can discuss. So we've got more of spears, metal in the woods. Checking of peace, the weaver's beam. Fight of women. Check on peace, brackets, ash spear shafts, or finally boast of women. The spears crop up there a fair bit in checking the peace and fighting, so kind of martial imagery there. Uh, because we already mentioned that the, the spear shaft is when you're going to throw a spear or use it as a, a thrusting weapon, you need the wood to be um, very straight, very strong, uh, springy somewhat. So it's not knotted and unlikely to shatter or what have you. So you need it to, to be throwable in that sense, if that's even a real word. Uh, so you've got all the martial imagery, the, the, the loot of Noon being linked to um, the making of spears and spear shafts and so on, for which the ash tree is particularly well suited, it has to be said. Um, potential for conflict there. Now the, the boast of, of women and the fight of women possible different ways of interpreting this but there is one story that I think is particularly relevant which is where Dadurga is hosting sorry not Dadurga um, there, there, there's, there's a big feast being held in a, uh, a hostel like, a, like an inn kind of sort of and all of the great heroes and their wives and the, the druids and the, the princes and chieftains and whatnot have been invited to attend this massive um, feast and um, everyone's settled in and there is a scene in which they've all gone off to the bathhouses and they've had a bit of a wash and scrub up and they've put their poshest clothes on and their blingiest bling on and they're all walking <coughs> out of the, the, the um, kind of sleeping chambers that they've been put in towards across the green towards the great feast hall itself which is the most elaborate feast hall that's ever been built and, and it's very very ornate and everything else uh, and this is the very first feast that's to be held in this wonderfully ornate building, um, hosted by Brickru, who is this rather slimy Yago-like character. Um, for those familiar with the Thelo, and always kind of spreading dissent and mischief with a smile on his face, and pretending to be very upright and noble, but always stirring away and causing trouble in the background. Um, Brickru has announced that let, let the bravest hero and the most beautiful woman be the first to enter the hall. And so there's this comedic scene where the heroes and their wives are all walking out of the, the bedchambers towards the, the great hall across the green. And of course, each one of them thinks that they're the bravest hero or the most beautiful woman and no one's prepared to give way to any of the other guests. And so when they see each other walking out of the houses, they're all kind of very dignified at first and then the women are trying to walk a little bit faster than each other and the men are trying to catch up with the women and then as, as they, you know, they get faster and faster and then they're, they're breaking into a run and they're hitching up their drawers and they're licking it across this green each trying to be the first one in and the women are screaming to their husbands you get off your backside and get me in there first and all the husbands are licking it to the hall to throw the doors open and allow their wife to be the one that is first in the hall and it is is it sounds a little bit Benny Hill, it is meant to be quite funny. Uh, and it ends with Cahulun being the first of the blokes to get to the hall. Um, his wife has come at it from a different angle, so she's not going towards the main entrance. And so instead he rips up the side of the building so she can skid on her ass on the grass underneath the wall into the hall before all of the other women who are going in through the main door. And so his wife Emma becomes the first woman, the Venus beautiful woman, to enter the hall and he goes in underneath as the first man. And that part of the, the other part of the joke is that in hitching up the, the side of the, the wall, 
Um, Brechru and his own wife, who's as bad as he is, are sitting in this kind of upper chamber in the, the great feasting hall, where they can look down on all of their guests eating. And there they're having a right laugh at the trouble and the mayhem they're caused. And when Cuchulain rips the wall up, they go sliding out of the, the window of the upper chamber they're in, and they fall into the manure heap that's outside the hall and kind of just desserts for them. So that idea of the flight of women in the post of it is that punch-up is connected to vanity, that each woman thinks she is the most glamorous and doesn't want to admit that any of the other women might be better than she is. The, the boasting is around that kind of slightly stereotypical cat fighty, you know, I'm better looking than you are and I'm better dressed than you are and all the rest of it that's going on between these women. And of course the You've got that idea of the um, kind of indirect secondary aggression, if we can call it that, where there's no actual bloodshed in this scene, but it's that kind of um, the, the women egging their husbands on to get very testosterone. Um, that, that the checking of peace, you can argue in two senses, that if you have a weapon, it can lead to the end of peace very easily, especially as we know with all the knife crime that goes on and, you know, lads facing up to each other and if they've got a knife on them they'll whip it out and before you know it blood is being spilt. But also something which um, Canadian psychologist Jordan Peterson points out when he's discussing male psychology. When people are, are posting online they might say all sorts of god awful things about other people, horrible horrible things about other people because no one knows who they are, no, no, they will never meet or be in the same room as the person they're slagging off. What he points out, Peterson, is that they would never do that face to face because they know if they said those vile things to someone's face, they would probably get their teeth knocked down the back of their throat. And so the awareness of somebody else's capacity to belt you one can be a check. If you know that other person is a right walkover, is, is very timid and very shy and very easily bullied, and you are a bit of a bully, then you'll go on and on and on, you'll get worse and worse and worse. However, if you are aware that that person will clock you one, that acts as a, a kind of an internal psychological restraint to think, I better not say that because otherwise I'm going to be knocked on my ass. And so that kind of checking of peace is perhaps you keep your peace because you know that that other person will flatten you if you step over the line. So you. If you don't know the other person will flatten you or you're convinced that they're too timid to do so, then you might get a lot nastier than needs be. So there is perhaps an implicit image of that in that if you've got your spear, your sword or in the modern day equivalent thereof, and you are capable and willing to use it, then you may never need to use it. That's kind of the argument, isn't it, around escalation of weapons between nations is that if you know the other nation will definitely use their weapons, then you don't go to war with them. Whereas if you think they're a walkover, you might go to war with them. And so this kind of part of, of Peterson's ongoing argument is that if you, uh, as a man or a woman for that matter, um, have the capacity to defend yourself, you not only know how to do it, back to the skill set, but you have the mindset to be willing to do it. And other people are aware that you are not... A, a meek, mild little thing, then they will respect you. Or at least those people that only respect violence will respect you. Some people, of course, will push and push and push no matter what. But the majority of people will be cautious of you. And so things never need to get to the point of violence because they're aware of what will happen if it does. Yeah, I think is what I'm trying to say there. Um, so it is perhaps symbolic of, of your willingness to walk the walk, talk the talk, fight the fight, and defend yourself where needs be. So it's a little bit like one of those caterpillars that looks very unappetizing so that no one even tries to eat it. Birds don't even try and eat it in the first place because it looks so unappetizing. It doesn't need to deploy its poisonous... Um, yeah, sacks and what have you, it just has to look really unappetizing to stay safe. Um, the weaver's beam bit, the, the ash um, bars were used in um, the big old looms and weaving frames again because they're strong and they're straight and what have you. So weaving you could work into that ideas of um, 
bringing different forces together, the wolf and weft, to come together to create tapestries and cloth and tartans and one thing or another. Kind of fusing different forces together. Put that on a basis of community, what brings the community of human beings together, that they all work together, they come together, they play together, they sort their problems out together. Therefore, mm, that capacity, let's all make the journey together, let's support each other like the stick going up the mountain. I'll support you, you support me. And also the fact, again coming back to this implicit defence issue, that if you go too far, I will thump you, and if I go too far, you'll thump me. And so we learn to respect each other, to get along with each other, because we know other people have a sense of their own barriers and boundaries, and um, what happens to those who violate those barriers and boundaries. Whether that's a smack in the mouth or a phone call to the police or whatever it might be, that there are limits you do not go beyond because you know there will be consequences. And that's what makes for a good community. Uh, there, there is a saying, is it Spanish or Italian? I can't remember. Um, that good fences make good neighbours. That you know where your boundaries are and you don't go beyond them because you know there will be consequences if you do. So you stay this side of the boundary. And there's that kind of, I think, implicit idea going on there. Um, I think I've rambled on more than enough about this one, so we'll, we'll, we'll draw that one to an end there. Um, and the next one I'll record, whenever I get around to it, will be off the um, Hawthorne, or Terror, which is the start of our next set of five. But I might do a general reflection on how the first five letters interrelate to each other before I go on to that. So we'll, we'll see how it goes anyway. And leave that one there, and if you have any questions, do ask. Thank you.